What's up guys? Tom Fazio here. Welcome to the channel. If this is your first time and if it is not, you are welcome as well. Uh, normally I'm kind of producing content along the lines of mind body development and peak performance. Taking a bit of a tangent here for a short series on, you know, I don't know, you might call it cognitive biases, you might call it uh, probabilistic thinking. Um, essentially I'm, I'm looking at the stuff underlying some of the thought behind my new book, Law of the Die, which proposes dice rolling for life options uh, as a means of getting unstuck, of generating momentum in life. It's pretty cool stuff. So the topic of this particular video, I'm calling the vending machine problem. So the vending machine problem. Uh, it's, let's see, I do have, by the way, uh, I've got kind of an appendix to Law of the Die. It's nonfiction. It's for free on my website, weightlessness.co, if you want to uh, peruse that. Uh, the the nonfiction appendix is kind of looking at a lot of the, the mistakes or fallacies in logic that most of us tend to make when we're assessing narratives, plans, roadmaps, things that we regenerate to ideally help us, you know, navigate uncertainty, uh, you know, produce a form some form of payoff in life. Um, but yeah, so this will not hit all the points that I've got in that particular section. Each of these problems has its own dedicated section within that 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 uh, ebook. So this won't hit all points within that particular section. Uh, but the inspiration behind it uh, came from a line that I think I read in one of Nassim Taleb's books. I can't remember which one in particular. It might have been anti-fragile. It might have been fooled by randomness. But he has this talking point that says something like, "There had to be a Warren Buffett." Uh, I thought this was a, an ingenious statement. Uh, I think it's very difficult for people at first glance to fully appreciate it or understand it because we tend to live our lives looking for the authority and insight of experts. And the problem that he identified with this one statement uh, is that expertise is a very difficult thing to isolate and understand for the main reason that it's very... It's very difficult to get enough data points to be able to assess expertise, right? And so the problem that Taleb was, uh, you know, identifying here with Warren Buffett is that there are not enough right calls, right? There are not enough data points that will give us confidence in his ability to predict uh, and identify good investments. Now that may seem crazy, right? He's one of the most successful investors in our generation that we've ever heard of. Uh, but he doesn't, you know, as, as statistics goes, he doesn't have a lot of calls made, right? Compared to somebody like a George Soros who has data points in the thousands, right? Uh, a Warren Buffett tends to be a value investor. He'll buy things of value, wait 20, 30 years for them to pay off. Um, and this has worked very well for him. But the problem, as he identifies it for us, is that now when we try to take what he's done and apply it for ourselves is that we don't know if he's become successful because he truly has insight, expertise, and knowledge in this domain of investing or whether or not he got lucky. Um, and again, this is a super difficult thing to understand for most of us because we tend to think if somebody has that kind of success, they probably knew what they were doing, right? And he's saying, well, they, they might, but you and I just can't know that. There's not enough proof. There's not enough evidence. Um, this also has a couple of cognitive biases that are wrapped up in it. One would be hindsight bias. Uh, the other one would be called survivorship bias, right? So hindsight bias means from the perspective of hindsight, we've got 20-20 vision. We look back and we say, oh, well, of course, of course it worked. I knew what I was doing all along. Um, and then the survivorship bias would be, well, you know, history is written by the survivors in all domains. So a good example of this is, well, uh, a mediocre example. It's it's a mixed bag. But a, a, a reasonable example is looking at martial arts, right? And I've trained at the Shaolin Temple. Uh, I've trained with several Shaolin monks uh, in my, back in the day. Um, and it's a brutal method of training. I mean, if you're really training the, you know, the real thing in China, um, it's... Yeah, that's it. It's it's brutal. I tell some stories in, in my first book, In Pursuit of Weightlessness, about some of those experiences. Um, 
But the problem is that not everybody survives the journey. In fact, a lot of people don't survive the training process. So what you wind up with is some of the best martial artists, best physical specimens on the planet, some of the things that these guys can do, absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, some people have seen it in videos, some people have seen it on stage performances, but when you go, when you go to China and you find some truly exceptional Shaolin protector monks doing their thing, it's hard to understand what they're doing uh, is real. I mean, it looks mystical, it looks like it defies all logic, and they are truly competent and uh, extraordinary martial artists, fighters, so on and so forth. So the problem, to get back to our original, our original issue, um, is that we can't say for certain whether or not it's the method that produces these warriors, or whether or not it's a, it's a tale and it's a story told by the survivors, right? Because it's possible that the only people capable of surviving this method were the ones that would have survived any method and would have risen to the top and become good warriors given any method whatsoever, right? They're just, they're cut from a different stock, built from a different stock. They're stronger, fitter, faster, smarter, and they survived the game. And the rest of us maybe break in the meantime and, and we just couldn't quite cut it. But that doesn't mean that more people wouldn't have reached a high level of performance given different circumstances or given a better training method, right? Or, or it's possible that some of the most capable or, or potentially, um, you know, skilled or competent martial artists needed more time to develop, right? I mean, I, I was a slow bloomer in martial arts. I mean, I remember for the first two years in my training, uh, I was, fortunately, I, I got relatively flexible early on, and so that helped me acquire a good range of kicking technique, a good range of striking and movement, uh, but I didn't have power uh, for a long time, probably until I was, you know, in late high school years, and, and for the early years, for the first probably two to three years, three years of my training, maybe four, uh, I heard the same things all the time, like, great kicks, where's the power? Great kicks, where's the power? Nice technique, where's the power? Uh, and it was this common theme, and it really was frustrating for me to hear. Um, but looking back, it gave me time where a lot of other people quickly learn to rely on their, their power and their go-to techniques because it helps them survive in, in fighting. I didn't have that option. I didn't have any strong techniques. So I said, well, I might as well trust the process, hone my technique. And because of that, after four and five years, once I started to get stronger, fitter, really you know, started strength training in later high school and especially into college, well, then I had the, the technical foundation that really allowed me to, to skyrocket and excel in those later years and, you know, blow past, skyrocket past the other people uh, that might have been peers at that time, but who compromised on technique because they were stronger earlier on, right? So this is a potential example of what might be missed in a method that that is too brutal too quick. Um, and... What we wind up doing is looking at this and saying, oh, well, they must, I mean, it must be the best method because, I mean, look at these guys. They're fantastic, right? And this has been a problem in sports performance throughout history is that it's been extremely difficult to analyze process or assess process because you've got exceptional performers, right? So you just assume method leads to performance. Um, but this is survivorship bias. It's hindsight bias. And we don't actually know. We don't have enough data points. Now, the one caveat here is that Shaolin uh, martial arts has, you know, I think around 1,500 years of, uh, of lineage to it. And so there are a lot of data points. And so this may not be the best example. I just use it as an example of how it's very difficult to assume looking at product that method Generated, generated that, but it's possible that within <laughs> Shaolin martial arts there might be enough data points. I mean, if you go to the Shaolin temple region year on year, they've got you know fields and fields of young kids, tens of thousands of kids. You can look out across these fields and see them all training and and um, studying the art. So it's possible that their method, that they do have conscientious practitioners and masters and and people that are refining this process over time. So tough to say. Um, but why do I call the vending machine problem? Back to the original statement. The reason I call it that uh, is because, oddly enough, funny enough, uh, you are two times more likely to die from a vending machine falling on you than you are from a shark attack. 
Uh, yet, if you show all of us two images, one of a shark, one of a vending machine, nobody's going to have any ounce of fear response if they look at that vending machine picture. And they'll have a considerable fear, fear response looking at a shark. If they, if they, if they said, well, you're going to be around a shark, you know, in shark-infested waters versus being around a vending machine. Now, it's possible that those statistics do not take into account percentages of people around sharks versus vending machines. That's, that's probably true. And so in this case, it is kind of a facetious example. However, from the point of bias, from the point of perspective, it's really interesting because we don't know that in the first place. And we don't think about that in the first place. And a lot of people die from vending machines falling on them, or at least more do than, than shark attacks. Um, and so this is a problem with our perception. It's a problem with our, our, our bias when it comes to probability assessments in general in that we don't do a very good job uh, understanding how, how the data reflects um, with a certain belief or a certain bias. And so, you know, this series is very much, again, dedicated to what tends to make us feel stuck or what tends to put us in a position where we become easily defeated by something. And this is one of those things that a lot of people set themselves up for defeat because they don't take the time to understand whether or not a fear or whether or not an ambition or a roadmap or an idea has any basis in statistical probability. This doesn't mean that we need to study the, math the mathematics behind all of these decisions, but it does mean that we need to look into a little bit. Like if we say, okay, I, I want to do what X YouTuber has done, right? Or I want to, I want to build X business. So people say this all the time, right? They'll say something like, five or ten percent of entrepreneurs succeed or right ninety or ninety five percent of entrepreneurs fail in business some people put crazy statistics and they'll say something like ten or twenty percent of them succeed uh, you gotta keep in mind here that there is a vast graveyard of entrepreneurs vast and most people don't even get to a point where they become part of the statistical analysis of the ones that do most fail uh, and of the ones that don't fail, most fail within a couple of years, right? Two to three years. So the data science behind it is crap. And the way that we tend to analyze the, the, those who are successful often makes no sense. I mean, you talk to 10 entrepreneurs, even if they're in a similar industry, and most have a different approach, most have a different metrics, most have different, uh, you know, different roadmaps. And so we, we try to extrapolate some, some sort of ideal roadmap or plan. If I just do this, I can do the same thing as those people. And we have no understanding of whether or not they are truly insightful and understand a process behind what they're doing or whether or not they just believe they do. And they just got damn lucky because they knew the right people uh, that they were able to connect with. They got investment when it was needed, maybe. Uh, maybe they you know, were the first in line to post or, or create something in a certain domain or genre. So many variables go into the quote-unquote success equation uh, that most of, uh, most of us are just at a loss for understanding what led to it in the first place. So, um, so yeah, I think I'll sum up this video as simply saying that it's really important when we put ourselves in positions to succeed or to, to try to approach something that's new for us that we don't go into it with wholly biased and false assumptions around what success looks like, right? If you think you're going to be a YouTuber because somebody else is, uh, and you look at a specific domain as a fitness YouTuber, it's a business or an entrepreneur YouTuber or Instagram or whatever it is, and you don't understand to what degree the people that you're looking up to are outliers, what percentage of people trying to do the same thing are having those same results, you have no information. If they are truly like a one in a million individual or one in a half a million uh, success case, these are terrible odds. doesn't mean you can't do it, uh, but it does mean that when they are giving you their method of how they did it, you have no idea about, what, uh, about its appropriateness for you or its applicability for you. And that's a really important point uh, that is worth considering before diving into any potential arena. Uh, it's also worth noting, though, that if you go into a new arena without understanding that knowledge, you can temper your expectations, right? And you might understand that, look, I might have a 5% chance of success, but knowing that going in and knowing the work involved might give you the grit and the fortitude 
and just not getting attached to the failures that are sure to come along the way. And it might give you a chance to succeed because a lot of people that hit that wall and that fail, fail because they've got unreasonable expectations that they are entitled to the same success somebody else does, right? But if you don't go into that effort with that assumption, you might actually be able to stay the course and succeed in the long run. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the vending machine problem in a nutshell. would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this in the comments. Um, again, this is kind of some of the thought underlying my book, Law of the Die, which is a fictional, uh, it's, it's fiction, it's awesome. It's looking at probability in life, rolling the dice for life options, and how we can go from a point of stuckness to a point of momentum. Um, but yeah, let me know what you think. And like, subscribe, be weightless, all that cool jazz, and I will uh, see you in the next video.